Hi, uh, we're here with Jack Hughes Hagman, who is running for U.S. Congressional District 7. Uh, Jack, would you like to go ahead with your two-minute introduction? Absolutely. Hi, uh, my name is Jack Hughes Hegman. Uh, I was born here in Seattle, uh, May 12th, 1992, uh, 28 years ago. Just had my birthday last week. Um, I grew up actually in Fairbanks, Alaska. We moved to Alaska after I was a little kid. Uh, grew up there, uh, moved back to the Puget Sound region for high school, uh, graduated school uh, here in the Puget Sound region, moved back to Alaska for college, and then I again moved back to the Puget Sound in 2015 and have lived here ever since. It was more like late 2014, but I spent a lot of that on vacation. Um, uh, I've been here ever since and have paid close attention to Washington politics. Um, I am running for the 7th Congressional District, federally, of course, um, and I'm running as a progressive candidate. Um, my personal history has is pretty tough. I come from a pretty tough background. Until, my, until high school, my dad had a tough time. Uh, you know, I don't know, I had two, two homes. My dad got remarried eventually, but things turned out really well. I ended up going to college, and I was the first person in my family to graduate high school. But uh, that's, that's about it. Great. Thank you. Um, so now we'll move into our four prepared questions. And um, we're going to start with Lori asking the first one. And I've just posted that into the chat box if you'd like to follow along. Right. Lori. Hey, Jack. Thanks for joining us today. So if Democrats win control of the White House and the Senate, it would be the first time in 10 years that we've been in that situation. What would your priorities be and what big structural changes would you be um, interested in pursuing? Um, one of the keystones of my campaign actually is pushing through federal marijuana, repe uh, federal marijuana prohibition repeal with universal amnesty. It's kind of a mouthful. Um, what that means is essentially removing, uh, making it constitutionally um, legal to own, possess, and use cannabis um, in all of its different forms. Um, and also uh, the bigger part of it is actually providing amnesty on a federal and state level for people who have been convicted of these crimes. Um, just from 2001 through 2010, there was over 8.7 million marijuana arrests and 7.2 million of those, 7.2 million arrests were from marijuana possession only. That's somebody found in possession of what is otherwise a preserved dried flower. Um, I, sometimes this is uh, for possession of a lot of it, but I mean, if I was caught with a truck full of roses, I don't think I would be spending, sometimes these are very, very long sentences for distribution and possession of cannabis. Um, this is disproportionately affected uh, minority communities and uh, poor communities, which uh, is really not cool, um, to put it lightly. Uh, if it was any other issue like, um, mental health or health care, something that you could take a step-by-step -step approach over time, that would be cool. But this is something that needs to happen immediately. 30 and, seconds. Oh, thank you. Um, this amnesty and repeal needs to happen immediately because of the sheer amount of people affected across the nation. And that's all. Great, thank you. Uh, question number two, Laura. With the COVID-19 outbreak, we have seen the existing problems with our healthcare system grow dramatically worse. How do you propose to meet our country's healthcare needs during and after the pandemic? If you support Medicare for all, what are your plans to overcome opposition and make it a reality? So one of my biggest parts of my mental health, uh, sorry, one of my biggest parts of my health care plan is actually starting with universal mental health care. Uh, getting the American public introduced to universal health care is tough, especially because of just the sheer cost of covering all health care. Starting with covering mental health care would be easy, and you could afford it with less than $1,000 per taxpayer, which equates to about $350 billion a year, which is significantly less then we've spent just on this COVID, uh, to put it in perspective, we just spent $2 trillion on one COVID package. That's several years of mental health coverage for the entire nation, every man, woman, and child. Now this coverage is very comprehensive. It covers psychiatric care, counseling, 
um, in and outpatient detox and um, some other select services like group counseling. Um, these services are incredibly inexpensive, um, even at their most expensive forms, um, including medication. So psychi psychiatric care includes the psychiatric medications, full coverage. Um, what this means is that there'd be a federal card you get, just like your insurance card. You can go into any current provider and it's completely covered. Um, even at, at the low end, honestly, with current usage rates, this program could only cost $150 to $250 billion a year. And at its highest cost, at its absolute highest cost, is no more than 400 to 410 billion dollars a year. Providing universal uh, mental health care is a quick step to not only improve many different issues we have in the United States um, uh, societally, but also dip our toes into um, universal health care. When it comes to Medicare for all, I think Medicare for all isn't enough. Medicare for all is a short-term stopgap measure that provides a lot of corporate stimulus. A lot of healthcare companies are going to be making direct cash payments that aren't going to be going to citizens or helping them at all. I think we need a true universal single payer healthcare system. And that's all. Great, thank you. Uh, question three, uh, Alice, and oh, there we go. We are likely to experience a severe global recession. What do you propose as next steps to end it and to provide lasting, equitable, shared prosperity? Um, one of the reasons I'm running is uh, back in July of 2019, uh, a couple months ago, the yield curve remained inverted. Uh, what that meant is that um, uh, national bonds weren't giving what people wanted them to. It's a really complex issue, actually. Um, this combined with other environmental factors, I actually thought there was going to be a recession in, in February. Uh, I actually have on my Twitter a pinned tweet from July saying, incoming recession in February, look out. Um, I believe that regardless of COVID, there was going to be a very bad recession. And this is because we have many companies that are propped up by government loans or buying back their own stocks on secured government loans to pump up their their stock prices and they're, they're zombie companies. They're not actually producing value. They're staying alive on government loans only. We need to end these programs, which cost the, uh, the American taxpayers, I'm talking billions of dollars, well more than we've spent on that healthcare plan, on the mental healthcare plan that I just said, we've, we spend annually on providing loans to companies that don't actually produce value. Um, we need to stop these direct corporate subsidies and instead, change um, those funds into direct small business loans that can go to individuals who own small businesses who are the cornerstone of the economy. Those are the, those are the businesses that are being hardest hit by COVID-19. It's not, it's not the big banks, it's not McDonald's, it's, it's not your friend Myers or your Kroger's. It's, it's your mom and pop shops, your tattoo parlors, your, your small restaurants. Um, so what I would like to do is provide more small business relief and strictly reduce corporate subsidies. Sorry, I'm done, that's all. Great, thank you. And a uh, question for to Sherry. There, um, a large number of people are frustrated with corporations seemingly getting all the benefits of our economy, even in a recession, while everyone else is struggling to make ends meet. How are you going to take on corporate power? What steps will you take to restore power back to the people? That's one of the reasons I decided to run with absolutely no contribution so far. I haven't taken any <laughs> contributions. I take no political action committee contributions, and I take no corporate contributions. I've thought about all three, and I've had offers from all three, but they end up being, they honestly, a lot of them don't even say, hey, there's any strings attached, but it feels like that. Um, some of my opponents take direct political, hundreds of thousands of dollars from political action committees and corporations. And it's really tough to say you're a progressive who's trying to fight corporate power when over 10% of your budget comes from directly from political action committees. Um, and then even more from corporations. Um, I think absolutely that corporations need to have their power reduced in the government. And this needs to start with overturning Citizens United. First, uh, it, it's one thing that the Supreme Court can overturn Citizens United if we change the Supreme Court, but what really needs to happen is we need to change the laws behind Citizens United. The Supreme Court can only interpret the laws of the United States, and if that's changed at a congressional level, that's all they have to interpret. It should be outright illegal for corporations to have the amount of influence they have today. 
Um, one of the ways I'm doing that is taking absolutely no money from political action committees or corporations, and I'm going to maintain that throughout my career. Um, when it comes to taking on corporate power, um, I think you have to be clean. You can't say, I want to take on corporations or I, I want to I work with corporations if you're seconds. taking the money. Um, so that's why I'm staunchly anti-corporate. It's uh, one of the main backbones of my campaign, and I want to bring power again to small businesses, like I said in my last uh, answer. And that's all. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you. Um, so now we're going to move on to our follow-up questions, and those are one minute apiece, and I will open that up to the board. Uh, if you'd like to ask a question, please raise your hand or message me in the chat box. And we looks like we have one from Jeff. Please go ahead, Jeff. Hi, thanks for being here. I appreciated your comments about um, uh, money in politics, and especially corporate money in politics. I've been involved with um, you know, campaign finance reform issues like the democracy vouchers in Seattle for a long time. Um, and I, I believe people shouldn't have to be good fundraisers in order to be in elected office. But I'm wondering, how do you change the law? How do you help overturn Citizens United? How do you get into office in the first place if you're not going to spend money, if you're not going to raise any money? Well, <laughs> that's a question a lot of people have asked me. And when I mean a lot of people, like almost everyone who I tell about my campaign asked me that exact question um, or something like it. How do you plan to affect change if you don't have money? Um, I think we've seen today that a lot of money, while really it can help you a lot, it doesn't guarantee anything. And while I admit I do have quite an uphill battle to fight, but honestly, you know what? I was born here in Seattle and I really do feel the people when I talk to them. And like I said, you know what? I, I'm honestly, part of it, I'm feeling lucky. I really do feel like, you know what, if you, if you if you have a righteous cause and you stick by it and, and you talk to people, if you really get out there and talk to people and show people your message, that can do itself, that can, that can walk its own legs. 10 seconds. Um, and so I'm planning on combining a little bit of uh, getting lucky with, I don't know, being an honest guy. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Elizabeth. Uh, hi, I uh, do a lot of work with the cannabis industry and the cannabis community. Um, and I am wondering if you can tell me a little bit more about your background working on repeal of existing uh, cannabis laws, both national and state, or um, the, the furtherance of the industry. So, um, like I said, I was raised in uh Fairbanks, Alaska. It's a really small town in the middle of nowhere. And um, one of the particulars about this location is there's no outdoor grown cannabis. Um, most people in the cannabis industry knows outdoor cannabis is usually a lesser grade. You can grow a lot more of it, but it's generally lesser grade. Um, indoor cannabis, where is it's usually a lot more resource intensive, ends up being a much higher end product. Um, I was actually raised uh, in different seconds. locales where we cultivated high-end cannabis. And that's one of the reasons I moved to this area, actually. I helped several different cannabis businesses uh, start up, and that's my connection to the, to the cannabis industry. I also have signatures on both the Washington legalization and Alaskan legalization uh, <clears throat> bills. Great. Okay, so you're, are you concentrating on home grow or inside grow? Oh, so um, that's where my expertise comes from. I'm down to support the cannabis industry in all facets. Um, but my personal expertise comes from uh, indoor cannabis cultivation, uh, which is uh, you have to be very particular with things like uh, moisture, airflow, um, electricity. Just the, elect just the electrics alone are very important. Uh, you don't want to burn the house down. <laughs> and a lot of people down here didn't have that expertise. They said, hey, I grew some weed outdoors back in the day. So being able to come down and walk a couple of different grows through, seconds. hey, oh, uh, hey, how to, this is how I should uh, grow indoors. Growing indoors is, can be, end up being very complex. And if you do it wrong, your very large investment can go right down the toilet. So um, that's, that's what I did when I first moved here. Okay, thank you. Thanks, uh, Alice. Hi, um, so you are running against an incumbent and um, the incumbent that you're running against is the co-chair of the Progressive Caucus. Um, and I'm wondering if you can speak to some of the things that, um, some of the reasons why you're 
running against um, Representative Jayapal in particular and things that you think that you would do differently in that position? Well, um, that's what, she's one of the reasons I am running. Um, I really liked her at first, honestly, and I, and I, and I do. Um, I really like her message. I love that she espouses uh, progressive values and she tries to buy people into the, to the new progressive movement. But on the same time, at the same time, it's really tough to say, hey, I'm a progressive, but every single year I take more and more money from the NFL's political action committee. It's really tough to say, hey, I, that's not the only political action committee I take money from. Seconds. Many different ones give me more money every year. And now I understand trying to affect change, but what change is the NFL paying you money to try to affect? And if they're not the only ones, then maybe maybe i don't understand the whole picture but it just it just doesn't seem right to me great thank you any other questions i have one um so we all know that congress is a kind of is very divided at this time um how would you uh work with that um do you have a a strategy for working with other congress people Absolutely. Um, I feel right now there's a lot of division, not in, con not on the, uh, there's a lot of division on the surface level of Congress, um, but a lot of it, again, is people trying to drum up their own base. People are really, really emotional right now on both sides of the political spectrum. We have people um, who just four or five years ago would say, I'm not, a, I'm not political, I don't talk about politics, who are now, um, you know, almost radical. Um, and it's it's not bad at all. It's really great to see people more involved. But then again, when you see some of the extremes that have come out of that, there's been sincere violence towards uh, minorities, towards Jewish groups. It's really, really scary to see. And so I I think as a really, really diverse dude who comes from a lot of different places, I think I can seconds. bridge those gaps. Great, oh, sorry, you. I think I ended a little early. Oh, that's okay. You're good. Yeah, Katie. Um, yes, hi. Um, uh, thanks so much for joining us. Um, you've been talking about your progressive background, but I wanted to ask, in 2018, uh, you ran as a Republican uh, for District 7, and so I just wanted to find out what changed between then oh, and now. So I, I ran for District 8, um, honestly, because I I wasn't going to run at all until Dino Rossi signed up. And I don't know if you guys know who Dino Rossi is or anything about Dino Rossi, but uh, one of the last things my grandpa ever said uh, before he died, he was he was not in well health, and he just he just hated Dino Rossi. My, my grandpa grew up in a, in a in a completely different time, and had a really rough 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 time growing up. His dad died when he was when he was just a young man, and thirty seconds. And so. I said, you know what, I got to run. And they tell you when you're signing up, they I, honestly, I went to a trip to Israel and I, I Googled how to run for Congress when I came back. And then when you're signing up, they say, what party do you prefer? And I was running against Dino. I didn't know who else was running at the time. And I knew I'd be running against Dino. So I put in Republican Party. Um, but honestly, I'm a, I'm a progressive. And, 10 seconds. Uh, that, that's it. I, I've honestly seen myself completely as a progressive throughout my entire career. They just I don't think there's any major progressives be labeling themselves as progressive party getting elected these days. Great, thank you. Um, Jeff, please go ahead. Yeah, thanks Jack for um, taking a second question. And in your answer to my previous question about campaign finance, one of the, th when I asked about how you win, one of the things you reiterated from your opening was that you were, you were born in Seattle and you mentioned some of the places you were from. And I just wanted to clarify, do you have any concern that the incumbent was not born in Seattle or not born in the United States? Not at all. Um, honestly, I think that's one of the reasons that she won before. She's a really strong candidate. When you look at her background, she came here at age 16, goes to Georgetown University. Um, I, her, her parents were from a pretty decent background. I mean, you don't go to Jakarta private school with, you know, when, from a really bad background. But honestly, like, I didn't go to Georgetown at 16. I, I didn't get a master's in business from Northwestern. You know, I didn't work for a you know, I think she worked for like a finance company for several years in a, in a hostile takeover or something like that. Um, unfortunately, like I, I didn't have those opportunities growing up, but those, those make her a stronger candidate in, in many different ways. Having a diverse background, coming, uh, her parents are from India, but she was raised in Malaysia. That's, that, she speaks several different languages. It's really cool. Great. Thank you.
Thank you. Um, any other questions? All right, well, we are about 15 seconds away from minute 19, so I'll, we can go ahead and uh, if you would be willing to give a one minute wrap up. Yeah, so uh, again, my name is Jack Hughes Hegeman. I'm running as a progressive for Washington's seventh federal congressional district. Um, uh, my website is www.hugheshegeman.com. Um, thank you so much for this opportunity to interview with you guys. And uh, I appreciate to to looking for I appreciate looking forward to the opportunity to working with you guys in the future. And um, if you guys have any questions, feel free to email me anytime at uh, info at hughesheggman.com. Great, thank you.